everybody, welcome to the Dreamers Edge podcast. I'm sitting with Nicholas. I write video game reviews for thedreamersedge.com. Francois, librarian and part time writer. Chris, uh, subtitler and uh, occasional writer. Eric, teacher, sometimes writer. Okay. And I'm Dimitri, webmaster of thedreamersedge.com and movie critic. And today we're following up our discussion from last week's episode, which was all about the uh, best of the aughts or. Uh, Double O's is what you call them. I like that one. Uh, we're e each going to list our top three movies of uh, the last decade. Uh, this is uh, Nick. Well, my number three we already talked about, but I'm not going to change because I did not see a lot of movies last decade. All right. So it was The Dark Knight. Um, number two, American Psycho. Yeah. Which is kind of hard to describe as a movie. Let's call it a yuppie that's a serial killer, kind of dead inside, and he kills people to the sound of 80s music. Yep. While describing the music itself, uh, I was watching that. I was like, I, well, what the hell am I looking at? <laughs> but it was a great movie, really enjoyable. Christian Bale is magnificent in He's, that. He sells it. He sells yeah. it. Well, I have to say I'm very partial to that movie. It speaks to me on a, on a, on a number of levels. <laughs> There's so many little scenes in that movie, but the card scene to me particularly is uh, it, it's very interesting. But as you say, you're, you're so right. Like Christian Bale like so completely manages to pull it off and it it's very quirky it's it's such enthusiasm when he's he's killing people he puts a raincoat on like, is that a raincoat yes it is like <laughs> super happy and it's it's just so fun to watch I and mean, i don't, don't normally like murders and stuff like that in movies but he was like wow he is awesome who is he killing next come on <laughs> that's the movie that made me discover christian bale and this is not a joke like this is not a joke this is not me retroactively placing myself as a casting genius i saw american psycho and i came out of the theater going like Oh, I hope he plays Batman in the next Batman movie. Because mm -hmm. the, the way he plays uh, Bateman as this sort of like, on the exterior, this happy-go-lucky playboy yuppie, on the interior, this big ball of like anger and frustration is like, that's that's Bruce Wayne. <laughs> you know? That's funny, because I thought that after seeing Equilibrium, but it was still like, this, this should be Batman. <laughs> I think there is also like well, what I walk, you know, the, what what I find interesting about that movie is it's, it's incredibly satirical, which to me is like I, I really enjoy that. And there's there's a there's a very damning comment to that movie, which is that throughout this entire movie, he goes around trying to confess openly his crimes, and these are very twisted and very funny scenes. But it's also a comment on how you have this, you know, we live in a society where you suddenly find out that your next door neighbor is this crazy killer and he's like buried people in the basement and whatnot, but you know, we weren't really aware, you know, and he was such a nice guy, you know, like and and there there's an element throughout the movie that recurs constantly of him, like I mean, he's stating it outright. <laughs> and these people that are around him are so wrapped up in their own lives and their own little things. You know, I mean Reese Witherspoon, <laughs> what a casting. What a casting <laughs> for that movie. I mean, you know, the whole, like, dessert cake thing, ugh, I just, you know, there's, it's a very dark movie, <laughs> but but it's a very funny movie. Absolutely. And, and I think when you describe the satire, you, you know, you, you nailed it, because I, I, I found that a lot of people are misinterpreting the movie, which has been the frustration of uh, the director. I, think, uh, I was trying to remember what she's done recently. But... Uh, the Moth Diaries is her latest Oh, movie. really? Okay, yeah. that's getting already good reviews. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, but yeah, I'm liking the name too. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say Mary Heron, but she she's expressed a lot of frustration because a lot of people have misinterpreted the movie because it is it is as you say like it's about him, but it's about everybody else around him, or like who who attribute such a sense of self importance to everything they touch that they they have no sense of what actually is important in life. It was really it's um, it was a fully realized take on something, and you know almost going back to what Frank was talking about earlier in terms of Lord of the Rings, like. I liked this. This was just a, this was a vision of of the source material, not a slavish reproduction of the source material. And it stood its own as its own and unique piece of art. You know, mm. unlike you know Snyder's Watchmen, which was yeah. just the same thing, just in a different format. All I gotta say is I'll never listen to you and listen to you <laughs> <laughs> ever again. And that is so true, though. Every time I, I hear the name you listen to you, that's I, what I think about. I'm thinking now. of, like, putting an axe in some guy's head. Like, <laughs> it's just, you know, it just, the thought just pops in there. <laughs> so, number one. Uh, How's Moving Castle? 
which is an anime about a young girl who's very shy and she gets cursed by a witch and becomes old and she needs house help to become young again. Uh, it was an anime that showed me that the Japanese animation can be, you know, something else than big explosion and robots and sex. Yeah. And yes, sex or guys powering up for three episodes. Or sex with robots with big explosions while the guy powers up. Exactly. In giant robots. <laughs> But it, it was a great story. It was like so much stuff to look at on the screen. You're, you're looking at it, you're like, wow. And so many other things are happening that have nothing to do with the main story, too, that just get wrapped up in like, oh, okay, that, that's what's here, that's what's there. It's, it was just really fun to watch. I agree. Uh, the, the beauty of uh, Hayao Miyazaki's work, who, the director of the House Movements Castle, I find yeah. an animation, and nobody has copied him, and I don't understand why, is his introduction of silence in an animated movie. This is the guy that did the uh, Princess and Spirited Away? Yes, yes exactly. Yeah. Princess Monarch and Spirited Away. Yeah. Uh, in, in Howl's Movie Castle, they have a castle that if you open the door, it leads you somewhere else. Yeah. And it's, it's a strange concept, you know? And what's great about it is that the characters who encounter this for the first time, before opening the door to go wherever they want, they always have that little pause going like, uh, do I really want to do this? And then they open it, and it's never, it's, it's not a dramatic moment, it's not a beat, it's just human behavior being animated. And, and that's what I, f I find so beautiful about his work in general. But that's interesting, it's a very cinematic uh, thing about uh, silences, where I find that this is the one thing that European films have more mm -hmm. than some Americans don't have. Uh, they constantly feel the need to, you know, have people talking. Mm. Well, um, music yeah, music yeah music. exactly and it kind of builds up the tension and I like that I really like those silences and then there's also the sense of you know like wonderment you know mm. and you know just the change in shapes and you know like and the storyline going it was just like and it was just visually captivating and it was a lot of fun I think it's a really good choice um, actually I had spirited away on my list which mm. has now since been revised but um, in terms of the, both films, I think they're both gems. A lot of people stay away from those because it's just it's, it's a move animation, and you think of Akira and Dragon Ball and stuff yeah, like that. All the worst niche yeah. things with like, exactly. these annoying fanboys, you know. But yeah. these are these are films. They're just yeah. 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 And it's a that's two Christian Bale movies. Wow, well, three with the Dark Knight. So oh, that's true. That's three Christian Bale movies. <laughs> yeah. Wow. All wow. three wow. Christian Bale. So. Yeah. It was the decade of Christian Bale. Um, okay, so I'll start. Number three would be Children of Men. Hey! 2006. It's a good one. Yeah. I, I'm a fan of science fiction, um, but I don't like when people say they don't like science fiction just because they're only thinking about giant robots or really, you know, like the space <coughs> operas or whatever. Like, science fiction could just be like one different premise that creates a different world. You yeah. Know, it's just, it makes it speculative. You know, it's just nothing else needs to be weird about it, you know, but it just, it's a different type of reality. And how fully fleshed can you make it, you know? And this movie, I found, did a really good job with that. You know, I really like the P.D. James source material. It's interesting. But in terms of the film itself, yeah, okay, fine. It's got a little bit of the shaky cam stuff. But it's also got some of the most interesting sustained shots. Um, and in terms of a science fiction world that's not overly done, it does bring you the information of the world really well, very quickly. And, you know, suddenly you kind of you understand the state of this world where people just can't conceive anymore. And why it's so important that this one person has, you know, basically conceived. And, like, what it suddenly takes to kind of, like, keep this person alive so that they can give birth. And the guy never uses a gun. Yeah, exactly. Throughout yeah. the entire film. He's running around and he's just an ordinary guy. Yeah, it's just Clive Owen is really, really good in this one. Yeah, he is. You mentioned the camera work. And, and I think that's one of the most amazing things about this movie. He Because he, there's one sustained shot where he goes through... Or like a ravaged street in the middle yeah. of war and he's running like from one end of the street to the other not in the straight line at all yeah. and the camera stays in the second like, you watch this and it's big you know it's big science fiction happening but it's not effects heavy or anything no 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 it, it feels grounded and real and you're like how did they do that how did they pull that off and it and at the same time you know as opposed to the batmans of the world like you know exactly what's happening at all the at all times even though there's so much going on around him He's tripping over things, falling down, things are exploding, but you're fully brought into the story. It's, it's really, it was great. I remembered instantly the realism mm -hmm. of that entire scene and how, you know, it's really one of those things where when there's a, you know, when you're in the middle of a war, the bullet can come from anywhere. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's one thing when you're fighting a war and it's sort of like, okay, well, we're over here and the enemy's over there. Yeah, exactly. But the good guys shoot red and the bad guys shoot blue <laughs> and everyone can dodge. Yeah. <laughs>
But, you know, then you have the situation where you're just the kind of person that's trying to cross through town and survive. And you don't have a stake in this entire thing. So it was really that element of it. But then there's a scene that comes after that, which is really sort of like there's a long sustained shot towards the end of the movie uh, where essentially the camera sort of basically pans across as you see the shocked expressions of various people. And uh, I have to say that in a sense, the movie is a kind of a build up to that moment <laughs> where this, the secret's out to a certain extent. I don't want to really spoil it, but uh, I think that to me was like really the, the essence of the movie. Number two was um, Pan's Labyrinth. <laughs> <laughs> I've got like five number twos. <laughs> but I chose it. That was on the same tier as Spirited Away, you know, and Up. You know, almost kind of like this sense of a little bit the wonder of childhood where it's just like things could be both beautiful but also frightening. Um, and I, this one, though, I found, you know, was just amazing just in terms of like the soundscape and just like how quickly it brings you into these weird little places that are just really scary. Mm. It, it takes place during, you know, like, just the, 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 War. the Spanish Civil yeah. War, and then there's the fairy tale stuff, and the thing is, is that if you were to remove them and make two movies out of them, each works perfectly yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. So there's never a time where you're bored, or where you're like, get, get back to the fairy tale stuff, or get back to the real drama, this is silly. It, all, all, everything's compelling in it. The one world is the child's world, and they're seeing one story, and the other is the world of the adult, and they're seeing the world from a different way and it's slowly those worlds start to collide you know and it's just it's, it's really well done the way it kind of brings that together and uh, just the special effects the makeup uh, the creatures the way they look and uh, even the sound effects like you know you often hear the general like his yeah. leather the leather glove and everything else like the creaking uh, of the wood the exactly yeah. and I thought just Technically, it was beautiful, and the story is really, really good. And if you look at it like, several times, you realize that a lot of the fairy tale creatures reflect a lot of the adults in the little yeah. girl's life, mm -hmm. and how she perceived them at that stage in their lives. And all of that becomes very fascinating. And going back to the idea that there's two stories that, you know, a lot of movies try for an ambiguous ending, and the ambiguity is itself the ending. <clears throat> this one also has an ambiguous ending. But what I like about it is that if you were to pick one interpretation. It works as a full story. If you were to yeah. pick another interpretation, it works as a full story. Like Inception doesn't even have that, where there's two possibilities at the end of Inception, spoiler alert, <laughs> <laughs> but only one of them actually makes a climax. The other is just sort of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Whereas Pan's <laughs> Labyrinth, you know, no matter what your mindset is, you get a full experience. And, and that's led a lot of people to sort of just take it for granted that their interpretation is the only interpretation of the movie. And I found it very fascinating that you can tell who's an optimist and who's a pessimist by asking them what happens at the end of Pan's Labyrinth. And by the answer, you can sort of tell what kind of person they are. And number one would be Once, ah. 2007. I'm usually not a fan of musicals, but in this case, like the music just drives the story yeah. Um, you get to know the characters through them. Um, and really, again, it's a sense of two people getting to know each other, but they're able to kind of voice some of their feelings through the music, through just the practice of music, you know, the routine of music. And it's not a world I'm in any way familiar with or like, you know, but it, I was completely drawn into it. And it's just, it's a really, really sweet, true love affair, you know, and uh, I liked it a lot. Yeah. And the songs are just great. You end up uh, finishing the film and you just sing those songs. You, you keep thinking about it. You're still humming at, uh, at the end of the film. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's one of those movies. You watch it, you buy the soundtrack as soon as you come out of the theater. Yeah. You just do it. Yeah. And it's one of those things that you want to share with other people. It's like, so have you seen it? No? You haven't seen it? So we're renting it tonight, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not too long. It's fine. It's Look okay. at this. It's in my bag right now. It helps as well is that he, he took real musicians as yeah. the actors exactly. and, the, the, their perf and I don't know how he managed to coach them, but their performance comes off so earnest. Their, the, the sexual tension between the two characters just feels natural. It doesn't feel uh, manufactured in yeah. any way, you know? There, there's a great scene where, you know, you get the sound guy that looks bored and he's like, <clears throat> okay, here's some idiots that are going to record their little tape and... 
he's already phoning and planning ahead what he's going to do that evening. And then all of a sudden, he starts to get grabbed by the song. And he's like, okay, this is pretty good. And he starts finicking with the sound and everything. And when the guy's done, he's like, did you write that? And the guy says, yes. And the guy is basically, okay, this is good. I actually want to spend time and harness <laughs> this and actually help out. Mm. And it's a great scene that really works. And I was like, yeah, me too. I'm listening to the song too. <laughs> I'm in it. All right. My, uh, uh, what I love about being last is that I have I get to revise my list and go like, oh no no I thought of that movie but someone else uh, mentioned it so that's gonna come up a lot. Um, all right, so uh, as my number three, I'm gonna go ahead and say, uh, which which was actually my number five, but it got bumped to number three now. It's Shaolin Soccer, two thousand one. Oh, that was fun. It was very choice. <laughs> Stephen Chow. Sorry. Yeah. It's just funny. <laughs> it's like I don't really have anything profound to say about it because it really isn't. It's a bunch of dudes who play soccer as if they were in a kung fu movie. That's the running gag, and it's freaking hilarious. That's all there is to it. And uh, it, that movie is actually the the movie that dethroned Jackie Chan over uh, in China as the uh, number one uh, box office grocer. Every Jackie Chan movie that has ever come out was number one on the box office consistently. Okay. And then Shaolin Soccer came out, and, and the was... Jackie Chan movie came out, and Shaolin Soccer went number one, and the Jackie, and oh, the Jackie okay. Chan movie. So like, at like the time of the release, they actually he, they got the number one spot. Yeah. Oh, okay. His next movie, uh, Kung Fu Hustle, or Kung Fu here in China, uh, actually is the highest grossing movie in China, period. But, hmm. I'm talking about Shaolin Soccer. It's funny, It's it's the jokes are so ridiculous. Yeah. And the actors are so charming, you can tell they're having fun. And that's the best part. There's a part where they're dressed as Chinese monks, singing at a karaoke bar about the awesomeness of Shaolin soccer. And neither of the actors can keep a straight face. And <laughs> it's the funniest thing ever to watch. Um, yeah, like, there's space for kind of like just ridiculous, hokey comedy. And, and you're right, like, Shaolin soccer really just like tapped into that <laughs> and sucked all of the humor out of it and like spewed it onto the screen. And just, like, just the um, physical comedy is just great. Oh I'm, yeah, it, tons of nose picking. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous, it's immature at the same time. I loved it. Mm. I thought it was uh, funny and fun. And it's immature, but it's not crass, which is also... Yeah, well, that's actually... My uh, number two pick was uh, going to be Spirited Away, but you've already talked about House uh, Moving Castle. And the truth is, although they're different movies, they both have the same qualities, which is why Chris and I are just like, well, talk about something else. <laughs> <laughs> so it was then going to be Pan's Labyrinth. <laughs> so I'm going to go with Sin City. Um, Sin City, I know, that's a controversial choice for some. <laughs> Frank is bracing himself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to get it from Frank. That's good. Get a little bit of tension in this podcast. Uh, but I go with, again, the theory of, like, you know, we used to make movies one way, and then the movie came out, and we did movies another way. And, like, Sin City is a movie that ushered the digital camera once and for all, that ushered the idea of filming things, you know, virtually, essentially, the virtual set. In a way that, to me, works, like, Say what you will about Sin City, it's rhythm and whatnot, and those are all good criticisms of the movie. There's never a moment where you don't believe in that universe, even though it's completely manufactured. And that's yeah. an interesting thing. You, know, you can't say that about 300 or, you know, Watchmen. <laughs> <laughs> or Sky Captain and the World of Tomorrow, actually. And what I like about it is that it's the first movie for me that capture comic books. Not the specific characters of the comic books, but comic books. Because... Uh, um, the best adapt comic book adaptations at that point captured who the hero was and brought them to a new medium, which is what an adaptation is supposed to do. It's certainly not to diss them. But what Robert Rodriguez did is sort of adapted cinema to comic book. And, and all the dynamic appeal of pulp uh, magazines and all of that all got transferred in a way that, uh, you know, a decade earlier, uh, Warren Beatty's um, Dick Tracy... Say... I think Dick Tracy tried to do that, but yeah. then it just failed. It felt static, it felt yeah. boring, it felt ponderous. This one was, like, that movie comes off like a maniac. Like, Frank, you commented earlier that the movie is too fast, but I think that's what comic books are. A fight scene lasts three panels, not half an hour. 
and that's sort of what happens. Um, I, I would say Sin City is, I, I consider it more of a graphic novel. Like, it, it, it took a, a slower approach, like the, um, what was Bruce Willis character? Like, I, I think. Hardigan. Hardigan, there we go. Because he has a big heart. He, he Frank Miller is a subtle heart. writer. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. There, there's a there's a scene where he receives a package while he's in prison, and it's a it's a grisly, scary package. And I had the sense when I was reading the graphic novel of a man trapped inside prison walls, not able to do a thing. Mm. And really, <laughs> that's how I feel when I read Frank Miller. <laughs> <laughs> like. There, there's a measure of, you know, really the time going by and him like slowly almost becoming insane inside his cell. And in the movie, I think, you know, there's about a half a second, you know, between the opening of the package and the scream. And there's no... That's there's because no... we'd already seen the seven. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just like <laughs> there are certain <laughs> things, you know what I mean, that I think, you know... I, I don't think it's quite as black and white as you're making it. <laughs> um, I think it's accelerated to its detriment, but I see that it's you're not filming the characters, it's filming the aesthetic of the art. You know, mm. you know what I mean? Which I liked. But the thing that I think Frank Miller's graphic novel or you know, pamphlet comics brought to it was, was the sense of slower pace because it was so stylized in terms of black and white. Mm. It's not the question of turning the page. Like Sometimes you'd have to stare at that for a little bit to actually start seeing the shape. Mm. You know, and that's what you lose in the movie. And the, the noir Because it feel. is so crisp. You know, right. you've so got the, the, the noir feel, you've got the over... No, no, but I mean, like, the, there's, that, there's, yeah, there's, you know... The, but the, there's a sense of, like, I'm looking at the panels, but I see them too quickly. You know, mm-hmm. and that's what, I, that's what I didn't like. You know what I mean? Like, I did yeah. like a, a kind of a sense of, like, oh, okay, now I'm seeing the shape of it. You know, like, oh, okay, it's rain. Okay, I got it. You know what I mean? Like, and it's just like, but it was very unique. But as a film, you know, I think it's as unique because, like you said, it's... No holds barred. You know, it's like it's its own thing. You know, completely, and it changed the way we kind of looked at it. It wasn't just a Spider-Man. It wasn't just you know a character that we knew. We were watching a comic, but you know, no one, you know, except for the couple of geeks, really knew the source material. Yeah, I know I spoke somewhat negatively earlier, but uh, I still think that it is a very good movie. I, I think uh, when you mentioned that it ushered the digital, or I think it was it was shot from start to finish in digital, right? Yeah. Like as opposed to because I think. The, the new trilo- Star Wars trilogy predates probably... Well, the, they, they, they the first one was the, shot on film. The second one is the one he shot on uh, uh, Okay, okay. The, the, there is definitely, like, an element of the aesthetic, like, and, you know, like you say, it's a very stylized graphic novel. So it was, it was a big challenge to shoot it. You know, it's black and white. Of course, you've got that effect of color halfway through the movie. I mean, it, 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 it kind of works. Like I said, there are some elements of pacing. I thought the casting was really spot on. I, I, it just revived Mickey Rourke's uh, career. Huh? Pretty much. Because really? he's yeah. perfect. He's that so is good. the perfect casting. Uh, and, but it's not just a casting, I think. His performance itself yeah. is. Because I love the fact that, you know, in this story, he has eventually a clash between two, another, like, another character, and they're like two animals. Yeah. And throughout the entire movie, Ricky Rourke is sort of moving like a gorilla and like deliberately imitating, yep. you know, a half man, half animal creature. And it's like it's such a subtle choice for a, an over the top movie, but it's so good. Yep. And he's just driven by <clears throat> you know emotion. You know, like there's not much logic in what he's doing. He's just going ahead, and like if you hit a wall, he probably just keep bashing it. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very much. But you got that just from you know like from very little in, in terms of how they sketched out the, the character, you know. So, yeah. all right, my number one pick was going to be The Dark Knight, <laughs> uh, but that was taken. Multiple so you're times. going with Inception. <laughs> 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 so I'm gonna go with uh, a one that's a more of a personal choice, but Million Dollar Baby. Oh, uh, I like that. 2004 clint eastwood movie about a boxer it's uh one of the few boxing movies uh or even sports movie when you think about it that does not copy the rocky formula that actually does its own thing entirely yeah, it's more of a karate kid <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> although oh. hillary swank was the new exactly. karate kid <laughs> exactly <laughs> But um, and it, it, it takes a, a, a dramatic turn uh, in the third act that you'll never see coming. And what I like about it is how they treat that element especially, because then the whole first two acts are more a question of getting to know how these people are, to inform a little bit what you would do in, in the dilemma that's presented, and whether or not the decision that's finally taken is the right one. And 
a lot of the right wing uh, people who complain about the, what the movie says don't realize that the movie is actually taking their side of the debate, but doing it with intelligent arguments, <laughs> and therefore, for some reason, that means that the big protesters weren't going to get that. Like that was the <laughs> weirdest thing. But the argument presented is some of the most intelligent, thoughtful, and sort of convincing argument for that that position that the movie takes on that dilemma. Morgan Freeman's uh, performance is fantastic. Mm. And I really like it. Well, Clint Eastwood and, and, and Morgan Freeman, like they're they're just they're such veterans, and mm -hmm. you know they they they've collaborated obviously before, and then you get to a point now where these guys yeah, know each other's right? beats, know each other's moves, and. Clint Eastwood, like when they'll reevaluate his career, like in decades to come, he's he turns out to be like a pretty decent actor, like I mean, for what he does. But you know, in the later half of his career, he's he sort of extended that. He's taken that that sort of that role that he has, but he's he's expanded on it. And you know, but hey, he's directing too. Like I don't know, like I'm I'm really I'm really impressed by the guy. Yeah, I I liked the film, and I certainly am intrigued <clears throat> with what. Clint Eastwood's doing in this latter half of his career for mm -hmm. sure, so I like to see him kind of popping up on these lists. You know, like um, I, I don't know if it's among his best, and I, I have to admit, Hilary Swank just bugs me. <laughs> <laughs> She's no white woman writer. No, but she should be. <laughs> so, all right. So, I guess that concludes this episode. Uh, if you want to share with us your favorite movies of the last decade. You can mail us at mail at thedreamersetch.com or post a comment uh, below uh, on our comments board at thedreamersetch.com. Until next time. All right. Thanks. All right. See you.